Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. Air monitoring is by Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Rollbar. Rollbar is real-time error monitoring, alerting, and analytics that helps you resolve production errors in minutes. And I talked with Paul Bigger, the founder of CircleCI, a trusted customer of Rollbar, and Paul says they don't deploy a service without installing Rollbar first. It's that crucial to them. We operate at serious scale, and literally the first thing we do when we create a new service is, is we install Rollbar in it. Like we, we need to have that visibility. Uh, and without that visibility, it would be impossible to run at the scale we do, and certainly with the number of people that we have. Like we're a relatively small team operating a major service, and without the visibility that Rollbar gives us into our exceptions, it just it just wouldn't be possible. All right, if you want to follow in Paul's footsteps and start deploying with confidence today, head to rollbar.com slash changelog. Once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. All right, welcome back. This is the Change Log, a podcast featuring the hackers, leaders, and innovators of open source. I'm Adam Stachowiak, editor in chief of Change Log. On today's show, Jared and I are talking to Tim Coulter, the Creative Truffle, a development environment, testing framework, and asset pipeline for Ethereum. We talk with Tim about how he got into Ethereum, Solidity versus JavaScript, smart contract testing, ETHPM, which is like NPM but for Ethereum, why decentralization, why DApps basically why rebuild the internet and last but not least who is using truffle and what have they built with it so truffle is called an ethereum swiss army knife we're going to dive into all of the details of truffle tim and we're going to have you explain it soup to nuts to us but let's get to know you a little bit and understand your relationship with the ethereum ecosystem and how you got into this game in the first place and how you became you know, the Truffle developer. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, sure. So uh, the short version of it is when the Bitcoin boom hit in 2013, when it went from, I don't know, $5,000 to $1,000. Uh, I got in to cryptocurrency after that and uh, got really excited about what it is and what it could do. So uh, early 2014, started mining, uh, mined on a bunch of different altcoins at the time, now worth nothing. Uh, it was a fun experience for me and did it mostly on the side. Uh, I was working for startups and have worked for startups uh, my whole career coming out of college. And um, the startup I was working at, I eventually got laid off. Uh, and by that time, I had been doing uh, other work in cryptocurrency. I was uh, I had built an application on my own time to track all of the price data for a bunch of different trading pairs. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, every trading pair on every uh, on every exchange available at the time. And I was trying to aggregate all those and eventually sell that data. In any case, that whole thing got me interested in uh, the blockchain world itself. And so... Uh, when when I got laid off from this company, I told myself, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna go work in blockchain. So I I searched around, eventually found a post on Angel.co, and that um, that led me to consensus. So uh, that was around April of 2015. The post was actually for a web designer job. Uh, I can't do uh, excuse me, not web design, a graphic designer job, and mm -hmm. I can't actually do graphic design. But I <laughs> uh, sent. I sent them a message anyway and said, hey, look, I could try this. I'm really excited to work in, in the blockchain world. I'd love to work with you. And um, and they responded the next day. Uh, so the, the the rest from there is kind of history. But as, as far as Truffle is concerned, um, my past history in software development is actually in the software testing world. So in college, um, I, I, I have a software engineering degree, but I, I worked a lot with a professor uh, in software testing and that was big in the software testing community. And, and so when I came out of college, I used that network to find jobs in the software testing world. And so what that meant is that for most of my career, effectively eight years leading up to coming into uh, the Ethereum world, I was doing developer support. And this is everything from performing manual testing uh, to writing software testing frameworks around you know new, new technologies. And mm. so 
Um, when I came into Ethereum, it was very clear that there were no tools at all. You, you had a compiler and uh, JavaScript library for interacting with the Ethereum blockchain, and that was about it. Um, so from there, it, it seemed very easy to fall back into uh, this developer support role, and I ended yeah. up building tools for the Ethereum ecosystem. Yeah, it's it's very apparent um, looking at Truffle that there's a lot of tooling around Ethereum that you know has been lacking and as i was actually commenting to adam before the show as we were doing a little bit of reading how we found eth pm which is like npm for eth right and for the ethereum ecosystem and i was just telling him it seems like everything is being recreated yep. you know in in this particular web3 you know ethereum world and it kind of reminds me of when node first came out and i remember ryan Dahl announced it and it was like a bunch of interest and a bunch of developers like okay this is cool i want to dive into this and there was just nothing i mean it was completely greenfield if you wanted yep. to be um influential and helpful really in node it was very easy at the outset because there was so i mean pick a library pick a domain and there was just no tooling and so it very much feels like the early days in that regard uh, with ethereum yeah so Everything you just said is uh, probably applicable to how it is now, even with Truffle and other tooling. Um, but it was even more applicable in 2015. Uh, there was one other tool uh, or framework available, and uh, I looked at it. I didn't like the way it was built, and instead of you know going into that project and telling them to re-architect their whole thing, um, I, I created Truffle, and really it was formed out of a bunch of scripts that I had, you know, built for myself to do all the, you know, 17 steps that I need to do in order to build an Ethereum application. So it just started out that way. As, as far as being influential, this is just something that I needed. And now uh, I've built the most popular Ethereum framework so far. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to go back to a small point you made a little bit in your backstory that struck me, which is that you said the posting by consensus. By the way, will you just fill in for all the listeners what consensus is so uh, so everybody knows? Yes, uh, consensus is a startup incubator for the Ethereum ecosystem. So effectively, we have uh, something like 40 different projects or teams. We call them spokes. And uh, these spokes are uh, working with consensus to become uh, their own companies eventually. Okay, very good. So you had the, this consensus job post was out there for a graphic designer. And like you said, you know, you don't know graphic design, but you, you know, you applied anyway, or you contacted them anyways. And it reminded me of that meme. I don't know if you guys have seen it, where it's a picture of a cat in front of a computer, like on a keyboard, and it says on the internet, nobody knows that you're a cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you guys see that one? Funny. Yeah, and it's so true. Like that's, I just, I just, every once in a while, I just kind of think about the power and the beauty of, of the web. And, you know, what it provides to people in a sense of, you know, not even anonymity in this case, but just like allowing yourself to kind of define who you are, and, you know, and giving right. us you know, the confidence and the ability to say, yeah, I'm going to go after that anyways. You know, I feel like um, there's a liberty that the web provides that uh, is a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Um, previous to consensus, I worked at startups. Uh, I think it was eight startups in uh, in roughly eight years. So no, no, it'd be seven in eight years. And uh, obviously, if I'm not staying at any of these places, I didn't really feel like uh, those those companies were something that I wanted to build my career on. And so far, I've been at Consensus for three years, which is almost as long as you can be at Consensus. <laughs> <laughs> can't, so, yeah, it can't be that much older of a company since Ethereum is, you know, uh, right. about maybe four years old. Right. And I, and I don't want to leave. I feel like I've been the most influential I've ever been in any company that I've ever worked for. Um, and I see myself, uh, you know, maybe maybe I'm getting to the right age uh, and settling down. But really, this is probably going to be uh, my career company for a long time. What is it that you do day to day? Just curious. So you, you're you started Truffle, but what do you do day to day? Yeah, that's changed a lot. So uh, when I started Truffle, it was literally I was coding every day, um, most of the time coding or interacting with our users um, in our Gitter channel. Now, uh, since the team has grown uh, in three years, we've grown from one to six. And what my job now is uh, is mostly vision and management. So 
effectively, well, this is this is a story all on its own. But when I hired developers, uh, I felt like what I was doing was handing my baby away over to people that were gonna, um, you know, go develop it themselves and go figure out what the the right way is. And that was actually a, a hard thing to to figure out. Um, but once we figured out the right way to work together, um, what we found now is that what I do is I work on uh, the product and where Truffle and the other products are going to go, uh, how those are communicated, you know, go on podcasts like this, for instance. Um, and I'm spending less, a lot less time coding. Um, and so this is kind of a like I'm in a, I would say I'm in that transition period now where my whole job and what I expected my job to be has completely changed. Well, that's awesome. It sounds like it's an exciting change at this point, hopefully in the long run. I'm sure it'll probably just continue to move and evolve as the company and the industry does. Right. I know that there's a lot of you know, CTO style positions where uh, there's satisfaction to the work and there's also this deep uh, inward desire to, you know, to get into the terminal and the text editor and, and code things up. Right. Um, right. So hopefully there's there's some balance there for you. But uh, nonetheless, uh, coming on podcast, getting to talk about these things, helping to guide a team of talented people, um, sounds like definitely fulfilling work. Yeah, it's um, fulfilling and a huge learning experience at the same time. And, right. Uh, you know, I have to take this time to give a shout out to my team, but uh, I've got a great group of people working with me and I couldn't ask for anything less. When you said the headcount... Um, that was just for truffle though, right? Not consensus at large. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was say, cause like, that was a little small for consensus at large. Oh, super small <laughs> for consensus. Super small. So, uh, and in fact, like when I say one to six, I was, I was, you know, worried myself. I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound like a, like big growth. Um, you, you know, truffle, we're, we're trying to keep things lean. And so six in a period of three years is okay. Um, consensus though, <sighs> I think we are, I, I believe we are over 600 people now. So mm. what did that point of clarity for those listening? Cause I'm like, I know the consensus is bigger than one to six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So consensus is huge and we're only going to continue to grow uh, as we bring on more projects or as projects scale. For instance, I know that one of our spokes, MetaMask, the MetaMask team, is uh, roughly the same size as Truffle right now, and they are getting huge uh, traction, and we're talking millions of users. And uh, so, th you know, that team needs to scale, and this is happening all across the Ethereum ecosystem. Yeah. Well, let's get into Truffle a little bit. I already quoted one of your taglines when you say it's the Ethereum Swiss Army knife. Uh, here's another one. Uh, a description, Truffle is a world-class development environment testing framework and asset pipeline for Ethereum, aiming to make life as an Ethereum developer easier. Now, when we had uh, Kevin Owaki on the show with Gitcoin, I'm not sure if he said it on the show or after the show, but he says Truffle is like Ruby on Rails for Ethereum. So those three things, Swiss Army Knife, Testing framework, asset pipeline, Ruby on Rails. Does that pretty much encapsulate what all Truffle has to offer? Uh, that's that's a bit of it. Um, two of those phrases that you said I actually wrote. So the Swiss Army Knife one. So you agree the, with those two? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, kind of. Actually, one of them is pretty old. So uh, Truffle has evolved from, from when it was originally created. And if you look at Truffle now versus where it was, uh, the features and scope have, have completely changed. So originally it was meant to only help you build web applications, uh, Ethereum enabled web applications. And now uh, it's meant to help manage the whole workflow uh, of building an Ethereum enabled application, no matter what your user interface is, no matter whether it's a console application, a web application, a desktop application, or what have you. So, the asset pipeline part of one of those phrases uh, is no longer true. We're actually, uh, we decided to, to get out of the asset pipeline game and push that off to libraries that, that do that better. For instance, like Webpack or um, Browserify or whatever we'd like to use. Um, but what we do, and, and Truffle's main focus is giving you the tools to 
build a smart contract. And if you come into Ethereum, you're not going to know what to do. Like the program, the paradigm, the, the way you program on Ethereum is completely different from uh, the way you might program on in other environments. And so this goes back to one of those things that, that you said where, you know, things are completely new in this space. And that's, that's yeah. part of the reason why. But uh, as far as the Rails phrase is concerned, uh, that is uh, pretty close to true. We are, we are, or I should say Rails was an inspiration uh, for me when I was building Truffle originally. Mm -hmm. So I, I come from a Rails background um, on the side. When I was doing all the testing work I told you about uh, for the startups, I, I had a Rails app that I built. And uh, what Rails does, among other things, is is provide that workflow for web applications. And we do the same thing for Ethereum applications. Very cool. Well, I think a very apt comparison then. Let me give you a little bit of the you know, the, the lay of the land from uh, Adam and my perspective, as well as our listeners, what I would expect in terms of developer knowledge, um, what we've covered on the show. And then we'll have you walk through, uh, because one of the reasons why we have you on is to A, understand what Truffle offers, but also using Truffle as a lens, learning what all it takes to build you know, these decentralized applications and what all the moving parts are, because as we've said, it's all kind of new and different. And, and that means it's also uh, kind of intimidating <laughs> and maybe difficult to approach. So we've covered Ethereum conceptually uh, uh, way back in the day. We had Gavin Wood on the show. We had um, shows about, you know, blockchains and uh, Hyperledger, Bitcoin, uh, distributed exchanges. We have shows about the con the concepts around blockchains, um, cryptocurrencies, what have you, Ethereum specifically. We've covered smart contracts, both generically and a little bit specifically with regard to Gitcoin, which was our most recent show. And with Gitcoin, we talked a little bit about how um, that application specifically works with regards to MetaMask and Web3 and, and those kinds of things. That being said, from a developer's perspective, building a, an Ethereum-based application um, all the way through, even after myself having all these conversations, uh, is still kind of a black box. And so um, why don't you give us the high level of all the parts that are involved, and then we'll kind of dive into to the specific regions. Yeah, so... If you're building an application for Ethereum, you have you have two execution environments that you need to worry about. You have the execution environment that your app is running in. So if it's a web app, that would be the browser. And then you have the execution environment of the Ethereum blockchain. Now that's if if you if you're a web developer, you would understand this uh, separation as just client and server architecture. Um, what makes things different in this case is that every action you want to perform on uh, the Ethereum blockchain uh, has to go through a transaction, and that transaction has to be mined. There's some wait time involved. Um, it, you, you have less control over the architecture, uh, and you can't create the responses that you'd like to create if you're if this were typical um you know server client architecture that would like return the right answer uh as a response to the request and instead you have to make requests wait for the results to be mined and on the blockchain and then do something with those results so uh that kind of turned things on its head a bit and uh, you have to program a little bit differently. So first off, uh, you have to get code on the Ethereum blockchain, which is a completely separate process uh, than, say, building your own web server. Um, you have to build your front-end application. That's uh, pretty similar to how you would do it now, except you, you would need software to connect your typical way of, of building a web application with the Ethereum blockchain. And then you need to uh, take all of the, uh, we'll say the locations of the code, or I guess you've talked about Ethereum, so the addresses of the code and where it exists. Mm -hmm. um, you need to take all that and hook it up to the front end so everything knows how to, how to talk to each other.
This episode is brought to you by our friends at Linode. Everything we do here at Changelog is hosted on Linode cloud servers. Pick a plan, pick a distro, and pick a location, and in minutes, deploy your Linode cloud server, drool-worthy hardware, native SSD cloud storage, 40 gigabit network, Intel E5 processors, simple, easy control panel, VMs for full control running Docker containers, encrypted disks or VPNs, 99.9% .9 uptime guaranteed, 24 seven customer support, 10 data centers, three regions, anywhere in the world they've got you covered. They also have cloud.linode.com, which is an open source, single page application. Find that at github.com slash linode slash manager. Plans start with one gig of RAM for five bucks a month or high memory plans at 16 gigs. Head to linode.com slash changelog, get four months free with their basic server, $20 in hosting credit. Once again, linode.com slash changelog. So what does that look like in terms of Truffle and the, the code that's provided and the code that you actually write? So the biggest thing you need to do and the first thing that you're you're likely going to do is worry about your contracts that are going to exist on chain. So the contracts are the code that's effectively going to run your back end of your application. Now you can you can build more complex applications that also use a server that are of the blockchain and all that stuff, but let's just ignore that for now. And let's just say that the the Ethereum blockchain is is your your, it's your whole back end, okay? Yep, exactly. And so what you need to do is you need to write all those things, which you're using a whole new language. You're writing code in a way that you've never really thought about writing code before. Uh, for instance, if you there have been bugs in the past that uh, two lines were swapped and you know cost people 150 million dollars. So um, you're you're writing code, uh, you know, and, and thinking about security and 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 finances and all these things that you know generally as coders we don't think about unless we're in the finance world. So when you say you're it's in a holding language, this is Solidity, right? So this is the Correct. language built by the Ethereum team to run on the VM and to right. interact with the blockchain. Can you, so you say you, you write those, those are obviously a big part of your deal, especially if it's in this case of our hypothetical example, it's your entire backend. Are right. there, where I would start with that and where I'm assuming Truffle comes in almost immediately is I'm, I would love to write a smart contract in complete isolation with like unit tests. Cause like you said, swap two lines and you lose a lot of money or you lose somebody's money. Um, is there tooling around writing those smart contracts a little bit at a time and testing that they're working according to you or before you're even doing any of the other stuff? Yes. So, uh, you can, uh, write your contracts and write tests with them and test them before even deploying them to any, any Ethereum blockchain. Um, so what Treble is going to do is, uh, help you believe it or not, help you compile those contracts because the compiler itself, um, is, is pretty simple. So it's going to make that experience nice for you. Um, it's going to let help you write tests in a way, uh, if you're a JavaScript program anyway, that you're that you're familiar with, uh, and interact with those con contracts uh, in your within your tests, you know, as easy as possible. And then after you're done, you know, writing the contracts and testing them, it's actually going to help you uh, provide a simple way of uh, deploying those contracts to your blockchain of choice. So this could be the main net, could be some test net, could be a, a network you've set up between a few people. And so all of these things, uh, except for perhaps testing, um, but uh, compilation de and deployment produce uh, very important what we call artifacts, uh, which include, for instance, the address of where that code lives on the network. These artifacts are super important because you're going to take this output from Truffle and then you're going to go integrate that into your front end uh, using various different tools and libraries or roll something your own if you like. And after doing that, you'll be able to easily build a front end that interacts with those contracts that you just built. Okay. Let me let me ask you something about Solidity. As somebody who's in, intimately familiar with it but also didn't build or design or choose it, Yep. Why Solidity? Why do we need another language, one that I've looked at, doesn't look like it has any particularly interesting aspects to it? Um, why not just 
a Python or a JavaScript, you know, for writing the smart contracts. Do you know why that had to be its own thing that now, you know, millions of people are learning and struggling through? Right. I think there's there's a couple reasons. Um, uh, first is we needed a language that compiled down to the uh, EVM, which I know we could probably do with a different language. Um, but uh, it's scoped around things that the EVM needs. For instance, like the cost of every instruction has a gas cost to it. Um, mm. And so uh, Solidity is kind of built around that as far as uh, its internals. But um, more importantly, the EVM supports, I believe it's uh, 256 bits of information or bytes or shoot, I'm getting this mixed up right now. But regardless, <laughs> hu huge, huge um, data types that uh, that effectively don't exist in, in other languages. And these data types have to be perfect. You're dealing with money. Um, you know, okay. you can't you can't use JavaScript to uh, you know, deal with large numbers because JavaScript only goes up to like, I don't know, 14 bazillion, which isn't that large of a number. So my hunch, uh, you know, I'm not from the, the Ethereum Foundation, my hunch is that they needed a, a language specific to what it's like to build for smart contracts, mm -hmm. or specific to the needs of smart yeah. contracts. Makes sense with the, with the gas primitives and all those things that something specific would make a lot of sense. Now, I, I think that's where they started. Um, the ideas around smart contract languages is evolving. And so we're thinking, or not we, but the community is uh, working on uh, other ways of incorporating other languages. For instance, I don't know if you've heard of eWASM, but uh, we can get a lot of the languages that currently exist in the world to compile down to eWASM, and then eWASM will be translated to the EVM. Uh, eWASM is WebAssembly. So, What's the uh, E on front of it? Is that like Ethereum WebAssembly? <laughs> Uh, I believe, actually, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not, See, I'm not you're reinvent, reinventing everything. Like, uh, <laughs> e no, EPM, e EWASM, well, gotta get your e-browser. EGS. What about email? <laughs> we could do email. Uh, Ethereum mail? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I think what they're actually, with the EWASM project, I think that they're actually doing is uh, compiling normal languages down to WebAssembly that somehow Ethereum can know about. I'm not a, I'm not too well versed on that project, but I do know that it's supposed to be the big connector of all of our current languages. Now the okay. hard part yeah. there is how do you take advantage of the specific things that make the blockchain the blockchain? Like how do you designate? Like if I don't know if you're writing Java or something, how do you specify that this is like a storage variable? Um, a storage variable for those listening is you know. Just, data that's actually going to be stored in the blockchain and you're paying as part of the transaction to store uh, versus like something in memory that is, you're just using that as part of a, a computation. Hmm. Okay, so we're, we have some, Solidity is what we have today. Maybe there's, there'll be better things down the road. I know there's competing blockchains that are trying to do things like, you know, a native JavaScript, smart contract language, but none of those have the size and steam that Ethereum has at this point. Right. Um, but solidity is what we have. What about here the is oh, go ahead. before you go there, Jared? The question yeah. is, is um, this isn't the only blockchain, right? You you do have other um, other I guess places you could do cryptocurrency. So we're talking about Ethereum here in this case and building on Ethereum. Is that is the language? Obviously, solidity is for Ethereum. Is there other languages you use elsewhere? You know, is this is only for Ethereum? Uh, solidity is intention. Yeah, as far as I understand. Solidity is, is only used for Ethereum. There are actually other new Ethereum languages, uh, if you're interested in those. Uh, Viper is one that uh, takes its uh, ideas from Python. Uh, LLL, which is Lisp-like language, is another one, which uh, obviously takes its ideas from Lisp. Um, I don't know if any of those languages are, uh, if, if people have written compilers for the other blockchains or... Um, or if they'll work on other blockchains. Now, I have heard of many other blockchains that use the EVM. So, for mm -hmm. instance, uh, they will change the consensus protocol around or, or change something about the blockchain itself, but, that, but still use the Ethereum virtual machine under the hood. And in mm -hmm. that case, those languages are likely to work. Gotcha. Very interesting. But for now, we're, we're working with Solidity as the primary language most people working with Ethereum use. Right, yeah. Okay. Right. 
I know there's a Bitcoin team that are building a language called Simplicity, I believe, which is going to huh. be some smart contracts on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. And I, I it caught my eye because I thought the name Simplicity was awesome for language, and that was pretty much <laughs> as far as I went into researching it. I have no idea the state or they got you anything. right there with the name. Yeah, I was like Simplicity. Now that's a language I want to use. <laughs> um, so back to Solidity. Then when you we talked about testing them in isolation and then you know generating these artifacts, are the tests that you write against the smart contracts also written in Solidity, or is there more leniency and leverage there to use other tools? They can be. Uh, right now, we support writing your tests in JavaScript as well as Solidity. So uh, you could think of these as uh, two separate but very similar testing frameworks built within Truffle. And both of them take after Mocha. So you uh, build individual tests. And then you have you have hooks that can happen before or after certain tests are run or before a suite is run. Uh, the Solidity ones works slightly differently in in that you're you're actually writing smart contracts that will act as your tests. So these contracts yeah. are being deployed to an internal test network that Trevel spins up as part of running the tests. They're deployed to that network and then um transactions just like the the same transactions you make to the blockchain are uh, are sent that will run those tests that will run uh, each each test function that you've that you've specified um, and so the benefits there's there's benefits to both JavaScript and Solidity testing uh, in the JavaScript testing you get to write tests that kind of act or interact with the blockchain from the outside uh, mm -hmm. whereas with Solidity tests you can write more detailed um, more fine grained tests that that interact with the individual pieces of code itself. So you can write tighter unit tests, I guess. Um, hmm. Now, something on this, which uh, we, we've been thinking a lot about testing, and, and as I mentioned, these are Mocha inspired and, and then I actually use Mocha under the hood in order to run. Um, Mocha is uh, one way to write uh, unit tests or write automated tests. Uh, what we're trying to do is build a plugin system for uh, Ethereum that will allow other frameworks um, for writing smart contract tests. So um, that's uh, that's on the horizon. Uh, probably Truffle Five, uh, you know, which might be a few months away. But uh, with that plugin system, you might see uh, more. Uh, advanced ways of testing or uh, plugins, uh, user contributed plugins that uh, provide different frameworks. Very cool. So that tells the smart contract and the testing story to a certain degree. Also, we're getting a little bit into the deployment story with you said the artifact generation. Deployment uh, to me is, is scary and, and uh, black box. Um, but then you also have these truffle boxes. And so in my mind, I thought maybe that has to do with the deployment, but I'm not sure. So can you talk about what truffle offers in terms of, okay, I've written my smart contracts. There's probably more to my application. We haven't really talked about too much about the client side that interacts with it. Maybe we should go there, but um, actually let's start there and then we'll get to deployment. I have my smart contracts. What's the other moving parts on the client side of my application where I'm interacting with those artifacts? Right. So, so the artifacts just provide information uh, to your front end that will allow your front end to, to easily interact, and it'll allow you to write code that's uh, easy to write for, for those smart contracts. So uh, some of the information, for instance, I mentioned the address of, of mm -hmm. where that contract might exist on the network, but also it includes information about uh, what functions are in your smart contract and the function signatures of those. And what happens when you pull those artifacts into your application, uh, especially if you're using the libraries that we've written, uh, is it'll actually create you know, JavaScript objects for you that represent those contracts. And then you can make function calls against those contracts and built into that library, um, it will actually make those transactions for you. Mm. So... Um, so you don't have to worry about the nitty gritty of sending all the transactions over what we call the, the RPC protocol, the Ethereum RPC protocol, and, and how to deal with all that. Instead, you're, you actually have a, a, a representation of your contract in JavaScript that you can just call directly. 
Well, that makes it super easy. You're just basically referencing functions and objects, and you don't have to think about any of the other nuts and bolts, you know, once you have that set up. That's, uh, I mean, that's the idea. You still have to understand that uh, your uh, transactions do take time. So it's not like, it's not like you're making a request to a server and the server as part of the response to that request returns whatever information you're looking for. Um, instead, the library itself needs to wait perhaps 15 seconds for it to get the right response. Um, and so what we've done is is we've written that code for you that effectively makes building that front end a breeze. So you don't have to worry about every transaction or every button click that causes a transaction or whatever. You don't have to worry about uh, what's going on under the hood. Um, all you have to worry about is did my transaction succeed or did it fail? And we'll we'll take care of the rest from there. So do you provide those via callbacks or like async await type of things? How does the actual interface into what Truffle's providing from the JavaScript side look like? Yeah, so right now, uh, the the library that I've described so far is uh, what we call Truffle Contract. And this is actually a library that's existed for quite a while. So uh, this one turns everything into a promise. So you can use async await with promises um, but it doesn't it, it doesn't use callbacks because uh, what generally happens when writing a front end for uh, a smart contract application or what you generally do is you you say make this transaction then do this transaction after a specific uh, request happened um, there's also other pieces of that so not all Interactions with the blockchain are writes. Not all of them are transactions. Sometimes you can you can call a function that will get executed, but uh, it's just actually just there for reading data. So it, it doesn't get recorded on the blockchain. Uh, it doesn't cost you any ether to do that. And so so a lot of the time it becomes like perform this transaction, read some data, perform another transaction. Uh, and so uh, this library provides it to you as a sort of a promise chain. So, you know, I'm doing this, then I'm doing this, then I'm doing this. So you can have easy control flow. Mm-hmm. Um, Something that we that we released today actually is uh, as a library called Drizzle, which is the next evolution of this idea. So um, the JavaScript world and the front end world has uh, been moving away from effectively homegrown uh, just transactions, you know, direct uh, interaction with the server, and instead, you know, you're moving to React and a Redux architecture. Uh, well, wouldn't it be great if you could take those Truffle artifacts that uh, Truffle creates for you, throw them into a library, and you've all of a sudden got a Redux store that uh, is tailored to your smart contracts. Um, so that's that's what Drizzle provides, is that uh, if you like the React and Redux world, uh, mm-hmm. there's almost no work involved to uh, fit your contracts into your front-end application. Well, if there's anything that us developers do like, it's having almost no work involved. That's uh, <laughs> that's always going to get us to have the the emoji with the heart eyes. Right. Um, for sure. So, Tim, how do you get all this stuff finally up and running in production for, you know, Web3 denizens to use it? Right. So um, two parts you need to think about, as we mentioned before. Uh, you have your contracts on the Ethereum blockchain, and then you have the front end. So uh, the the one we haven't really talked about is the, the contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, it, in putting your contracts on the Ethereum blockchain, if you were to just go do it yourself, uh, there's a lot you'd have to do. So uh, we've mentioned these artifacts before. You'd have to like save all those artifacts, somehow create a way for you to uh, save them in a specific format and then integrate that into your front end and you know X, Y, and Z uh, make to make that work. Uh, instead of worrying about all that during your deployment process, what you'd rather worry about is the steps of the of actual deployment of get this contract on the network then get this one and pass the right data to that contract and then get this one uh you know perhaps make a few transactions to configure those contracts after they're on the network and then you're done that like that's that's what you want to think about so uh what we have in truffle is uh, a system that got its ideas as i mentioned before from rails so so we our deployment mechanism is actually called migrations. And what you do in migrations is you write steps uh, for deployment. Effectively, there's small 
deployment scripts and what you you use a library that that we provide you as part of the migrations is called the deployer and you just say i would like to deploy this contract so deployer.deploy this contract and then you can you know write multiple lines and deploy another one or or uh, deploy a contract passing variables um, and then what this sets up for you is you, you get these first sets of contracts that make let's say version one of your application out uh, and then you've already got a system with which you can change alter or perhaps update your contracts later uh, mm -hmm. in a migration system very similar to Rails. So the, the short version of this is, is ideally you can, you can write deployment scripts with Truffle. Uh, these scripts, you, you get to worry about what you need to do rather than all the nitty gritty details. And then Truffle will save all that data for you and make it easy for you to integrate with your front end. Mm. And then you just push your front end out to a CDN somewhere or on your web server and just serve it up. Yep. So what we found is that uh, the front end is, and how to do the front end, and how to build and and release the front end is uh, hotly debated and changes to effectively depending on your developer preferences. So, yeah. so like like I mentioned, we got out of the pipeline game. Um, the way that Truffle's built now, you can use this same workflow to build a web-based application as you can. Uh, to build a desktop application, for instance, you you have the artifacts, and then you integrate with that with your front end, depending on what your front end actually is. So, what exactly is a front end? Well, uh, it's it's the part of the application that the user interacts with, and it's very different depending on what type of application you're, you're working on. Uh, if you're working on a web application, it's going to be something that runs in the browser, and you have to deal with all the uh, the details of deploying a browser-based application. For instance, like um, taking all of your your assets, your, your JavaScript, and you know bundling them and putting them into uh, a single file, and then somehow pushing that off to a server that's going to host that um, for uh, an electron based application for instance it's kind of similar but a, a bit different you have to get those artifacts injected into the application itself and then like actually you know create builds that are compiled to create the desktop application um, but there's even a front end and a console application uh, and that front end is is what you type into the terminal itself so so it's the uh, interface Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Maybe that was the easier way to say it. <laughs> yes. The interface. Yeah. But it's the interface is always different, and whatever interface right. you're you're working with changes what you're going to do. So um, Truffle doesn't doesn't do that for you anymore, and we we guide you how you might do that, but otherwise um, let you do it yourself. Gotcha. Very cool. Well, uh, I would be remiss not to mention another feature of Truffle that uh, made me very excited as it is basically where I live with building uh, Ruby on Rails applications or building uh, Elixir and Phoenix-based applications is uh, Truffle provides an interactive console for direct contract communication. Please tell me that that's not something you've moved away from. Because that right there is like how I do most of my coding. It's just <laughs> dorking around in the console until uh, I figure something out. We we have not moved away from that. We we 100% still support that. There's two features now. You can type in Truffle console and connect to a a currently running Ethereum client, so maybe the mainnet or something. Um, or you can type Truffle develop and it will spin up a uh, in memory blockchain for you that you can just use for development. And in both cases, you get a console uh, that takes the, your contracts that you have, takes those artifacts, um, turns those into that JavaScript representation of, of those contracts and allows you to interact with those right from the console itself. So you're, you're, you're not typing Solidity in that console, you're typing JavaScript, but you have access to your contracts uh, just like you would if you were writing that code uh, in your front end. Very cool. That is worth the price of admission for me right there, <laughs> especially since the price of admission is always zero with open source software. <laughs> that's uh, actually, that's really great to hear because I don't, um, I don't actually program with the console so much. Um, oh. How do you do it, man? How do you do it? <laughs> I guess you. I, I guess you write say. tests. Huh? I don't even want to say. So, so actually, this is something that we we should talk about. But um, well, I write tests, but uh, I I almost hate to say it. I I, I use console.log a lot in the browser. It's terrible. Um, 
But uh, one thing that we're working on now, uh, like actively working on, and will likely be released in uh, a week or two weeks, depending on how this works, is a interactive Solidity debugger. So, uh, you know, this goes back into the things we talked about as far as having to recreate the things that we all uh, love uh, in development. And uh, here we're going to have a debugger where where you can make a transaction and then debug that transaction no matter what Ethereum client you're on or using. It doesn't matter if you're in Geth or Parity or something else or using our own internal Ethereum client. And, uh, and you could actually see in, in Solidity code, step through the Solidity code and see what happened. Um, uh, if you've used the debugger and you've used uh, one to figure out tough issues before, well, you obviously know, know the value of this, but really this is kind of opening up the black box that is the Ethereum uh, virtual machine. So um, that's something that's going to that's gonna be a huge, huge feature and uh, should come out in, you know, like I said, a couple weeks. Very cool. Two other quick things that we will mention, as we mentioned before, truffle boxes. Um, which you can tell us about real quick. And then also we do want to hear about ETHPM and what all is on offer there. So uh, what are Truffle Boxes? Yeah, so uh, they're effectively our answer to rolling your own front end. So uh, you have to integrate Truffle's artifacts with different kinds of front ends. What we do with Truffle Boxes is give you boilerplates for how to do that uh, in different styles of applications. So... Um, it depends heavily on, on what you want to use, and front-end developers seem very attached to some of the libraries that you're using, for, and, and for good measure. So we have Truffle boxes that show you how to use Truffle with React. We have Truffle boxes that show you how to use Truffle with Webpack in order to build your application. Mm. Uh, we have Truffle boxes with uh, you know eight to ten boilerplates of how to build different styles of applications, and we're building more as necessary as fast as we can. Very cool. And ETHPM, uh, we're very well familiar with NPM. This has to be an Ethereum-based package manager. What are the kind of packages that you could pull into a Truffle you know, framework uh, app that would you know, do some heavy lifting for you? What are some examples? Yeah, so um, the basic package that you'd want from FPM or even NPM is a source package. So literally it downloads the source for you and then it runs as part of your, part of your application. In this case, you would download Solidity uh, code as a source package. But, but because people can deploy contracts to any network, but, but let's just let's just say for the main net for now, because you can deploy contracts to the main net, um, you could actually create packages that connect your application uh, with their application. Uh, so for instance, if you are downloading a package uh, and it contains artifacts of addresses of contracts that the package maintainer deployed, you could then um, integrate those easily into your application uh, and build off of their code. I mean, and that's part of the visions of Ethereum or the promise of Ethereum is that, you know, not only we're going to be able to build our own applications and deploy them, but we're going to be able to build applications that build off of everything other people have deployed. So that's the idea of FPM. It's still having uh, a bit of trouble gaining adoption, but uh, we're working on that and hopefully we'll have uh, new versions in the future. This episode is brought to you by Gliffy. Gliffy is the easiest way to visualize any idea in a world where it's possible to draw a circle in the cloud and put an arrow to a square with some text in it, there lives a tool with over four and a half million users who can easily diagram online or directly in Atlassian on Confluence or Jira. And in this segment, Craig Cockrell, part of design at Plastic, shares how his team lives and dies by this tool. For me, using Gliffy is, is really nice just because I'm able to really not have to worry about the tool as much. I can sit here and really focus on what I actually want to accomplish. The way that I've described it to other people uh, in general is it's something that's very hands-on. Like it, it feels as though you're really using very material objects uh, and rearranging them on the fly and, and making that movement from taking this screen and, and moving it towards the end or reconfiguring that flow. It's not something where you really need to feel the pain of going through that. It, it comes so naturally that you know the tool is almost secondary and what I'm trying to focus on and, and get done is, is the primary goal. 
you know, ideas live or die on the diagrams that people create in Gliffy. If you're not creating that fidelity, it's something that it's very easy for that to just literally fall off to the wayside. You know, within the company here at, at our core, a startup, right? People have a lot of ideas and they have a lot of things, but there's obviously gaps in communication. And without something to actually bring to people and bring to the table and show that you've done some level of work, you've done some sort of background. You know, Gliffy Diagram is one of the best things that anyone has ever brought to any sort of product inception meeting or anything like that. And that is truly where we can start that collaborative process. Without that, that conversation doesn't happen. The right stakeholders don't get involved. And at that point, you don't have anyone rallying behind you and without you know the group rallying behind a certain project it just doesn't happen when anything begins it's so important that those individuals open Gliffy in confluence get in there start working and just get it started it's just something that allows you know a, a canvas for us to create all right it's easy to get started try it free in Atlassian or online at gliffy.com slash changelog or also learn how to get 25% off one year of Gliffy in Confluence or Jira. Those details are shared at gliffy.com slash changelog. Start building your ideas with your team today. And if you don't have a project to work on, draw a duck, set it as your desktop wallpaper, learn how easy it is. Draw something today at gliffy.com slash changelog. So Tim, one thing that I've been thinking as you talk, especially back when you were talking about the anatomy uh, of a uh, app of a Web3 decentralized application is you have to wait, you know, you have to wait because it has to go onto the blockchain, it has to be confirmed, what have you. Consensus has to happen. These things have to happen on chain. And we've we've talked a few times, I guess, Adam, I think, was it... Uh, Preethi Cassaretti, who talked about Ethereum scaling, and we've had scaling yes. problems. We've had Crypto Kitties. There, you know, all of the transactions going on the blockchains are causing many people to talk about how we're going to scale proof of stake versus proof of work, sharding, all these right. different things, right? And so the question is, is like, why are we go? Why are we doing all of this? If we get a little bit big picture again. What's the big wins? Because we're talking about the details, but when we look at the forest, instead of these little, little tr cute little truffle trees, um, <laughs> what's, why are we going through all these hoops to get dApps? Like, what's the big win? Uh, you know, everybody looks at CryptoKitties, and, and uh, some people might laugh or, or not take it seriously, but it's actually uh, a great example of something you can do on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and, and the thing here is, is that they created, uh, we'll just call it digital art, um, and created ownership of digital art and something that people can interact with. Now, that use case in and of itself isn't necessarily... Uh, the most compelling use case, but it brought it, it, it brought, you know, Ethereum to the forefront of like what we can do. You can take applications like this that create ownership or uh, manage finances or script, in, you know, trustless interactions with people using the Ethereum blockchain. And it, and it, you know, kind of changes the way we build things. So I want to give you an example. I mentioned CryptoKitties because I want to give you an example of something else that you can do. And this is going on to the, the vision of Ethereum. Um, they built CryptoKitties because they thought they were building a, a fun application that people can interact with. And I'm, I'm sure they made, they have a fee system in there. So I'm sure they made, uh, you know, quite a lot of money in, in doing it. Um, something that, you know, Truffle is doing on the side for fun is, and creating a, an application called that we call the Pouncing Dead. Uh, we we're gonna call it Crypto Zombies, but somebody stole our name. So mm. the, the Pouncing Dead, and 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 what's cool about this is um, we can do what I was talking about before of building our own application that extends the use cases of uh, somebody else's application. So in, in ours, what you do is you send ownership of, of your kitty, you send ownership over to the what we call the horde, and you if, if, if it's essentially sacrifice your kitty uh, over to the horde and you create it and you get a zombie <laughs> out of it. Oh you, my gosh. You, you, 
you kill your kitty. Um, <laughs> and the, but but in killing this kitty, you get a new uh, you get a new token. You get a new piece of, for for lack of a better word, a new piece of digital art. And uh, what you can do from there is trade them and you know just, just like you would uh, crypto kitties. But you could also feed other people's kitties to your zombie to create even more zombies um and and the you know the zombie apocalypse comes out now uh what we can what we can do with that is instead of making money is the pouncing dead oh. um we can uh take that fee structure and um give it to the horde itself and so that whenever you sacrifice a kitty over to the horde uh that money gets paid out to you. Um, we could actually create this really interact, and, and in doing so, you get. I mean, you guys reacted yourself. Like this is so cool. Like, like we can create this really interactive system uh, where you know people are interacting with crypto kitties or interacting with crypto zombies. It becomes uh, it, it becomes a narrative that's fun to talk about and fun to interact with. Um, and like I mentioned, this this is just one thing that you can do. Um, people are using the Ethereum block blockchain to manage provenance of fish or products that get created and make sure that the authentic things are, you know, finally make it to consumers. Um, people are using it to check out oil production and make sure that we're, we're producing things right. Like blood diamonds don't need to happen anymore. Um, we can create applications like uh, decentralized eBay, where you, you, for instance, eBay uh, is great in that it brings people together, but they went along with PayPal, they take a 17 and percent cut, which is outrageous. Like that, that doesn't need to happen anymore. The value transfer can happen over Ethereum. And so uh, what we're going to do is reduce the, uh, what we say, the amount of rent seekers that are in our industry today that are just kind of building an asset and then sitting on that asset and instead put that value over to everybody else. Um, you know, and part of this question was really hard for me to answer because there's, there's so many cool things that people can build, but a lot of the stuff like, like we haven't even thought of yet. Um, mm -hmm. The promise of Ethereum is is there, uh, and we just need things like Crypto Kitties and the Pouncing Dead to show us how cool this stuff is. Well, it's certainly yeah. a place to jump in and, and in a fun way understand and learn. You know, right? It's right for innovation. Yeah, you can see the potential, but all of the uses so far have either been, admittedly, I thought Crypto Kitties was kind of brilliant. But as a game, you know, as a as a piece of digital art, I love weird internet art things, <laughs> but not you know revolutionizing the world. Um, I but think you can learn better by fun. You know, you learn while having fun. Sure, very well. I think ICOs. I think crowdfunding was a great example of a capability that was unlocked. Right. Um, and then we you know we see the positives and the and the drawbacks yeah. of that with the scams and what have you, but. That's kind of just the market, you know, sorting itself out. Um, but I think we all can agree that a lot, like Adam's saying, it's 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 a good place to jump in and be kind of bleeding edge and have fun and learn something that's um, has tons of opportunities. But I don't know if any of us have even seen what you know where the real killer use case is, where they're coming. You know, right? I have one question before we go to that. It's it's um in a world where we have to. I think it's always been this way, but in a world where where we need verifiability or trust in a marketplace, like you had said, to ensure authenticity, how do you attach the real world to a blockchain in terms of knowing that I've authentically s sent you this eBay item or given you this blood diamond or non-blood diamond? How do you track real world in, in blockchain? How does that attach itself? Yeah, so uh, you know that's a, that's a hard part. Like like you only transfer digital value. Y you can only easily transfer digital value uh, right. over Ethereum itself. Uh, you'll have to use external systems that connect to the blockchain in order to transfer real world value. So, uh, for instance, I mentioned the eBay uh, example. The value transfer that I mentioned there is only the value transfer of of buyer paying seller. It's not the value transfer of um, the actual product or the, or the physical good being sold, being transferred over. Here, there, there will always be uh, a level of trust uh, involved uh, when you deal with the physical world. You're going to have to trust FedEx in this case. But tr FedEx could implement features that track the 
location of the good and where it's at and who's handling it on the blockchain if that actually makes sense for them. Uh, it, the FedEx example of, of actually putting that on there, that may or may not make sense um, for this example because – Basically, we're all fine with going to, uh, you know, checking our tracking number online and using their their current existing databases. Like blockchains don't make sense all the time, but um, there are cases where you might want to track, uh, you know, physical goods and where they're coming from and uh, pair identity, which is something we're we're solving, but um, pair identity with. Uh, the blockchain itself, and so you then have this person making a statement that something about the real world is true, whether it's being the location of a physical yeah. good or or something else. And so if we can do that right, and we get the identity thing down, then it can unlock uh, quite a bit of things. And you know, it's it's going to come down to, um, you know, I, I suppose I could lie in person to you, talking to you as much as I could you know, make a transaction on the blockchain. But uh, if we can build systems that, uh, that that make that harder or make it very clear that I'm the one who embezzled uh, whatever this thing was, uh, then, you know, perhaps we can, you know, increase accountability or, or what have you. Right. The blockchain provides one side of the equation of truth. Right. Right. And then it's up to us to have the other side, which is physical truth. Right. Yeah. Or somehow bridge those, you know, the the analog and the digital systems with RFID chips and you know FedEx integrations. Yeah, although, admittedly, at that point, you know your your trusted third party is FedEx. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're sometimes sometimes I feel like we're the uh, the cat in the cat cat in the hat, you know, where they have the stain on the tub and they clean it off the tub, but now it's on the you know, <laughs> the, 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 yeah. on the rag, and then it's off the rag, and it's on the wall, and they're just kind of pushing that that smudge around and can't actually get rid of it. Um, but it's progress, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and there's there's some things that I, I mentioned identity because that's really important to effectively everything we do on the blockchain. But for instance, if we get identity solved, um, and you know, the politics around voter ID laws are such that it's fine. Uh, we could actually have secure voting uh, online without the, the possibility of uh, tampering. Tampering, exactly. Yeah. Like cohesion or all the things. Right. You're, yeah. you're explaining, I think, where we're trying to go is like real world examples. Like right. who's using it? Why are they using it? What are they building with it? You know, we kind of know some examples now, like we've mentioned ICOs and. Uh, right. You know, fundraising and different things like that, actual value, which is a cryptocurrency or in this case, you know, maybe the FedEx example or eBay, for example. But other examples might be pretty interesting to to share. Do you can you share more about like what people are building with it and why they're building with it? Maybe what the value is happening in, in a certain you know community around what they're building? Yeah. So the current things that are being built uh, are mostly around financial transactions. Um uh, and that's because uh, our money's been – it's been digitized for years now, uh, and so it's really easy to write code or systems that, that mimic the, the, the ones we already have, but in a, uh, in a trustless manner. So, for instance, uh, I forget the word, but there's, there's this idea of uh, taking two assets. If, if, if both of us own uh, an asset uh, of a different type and um, we want to swap the risk uh, of, of owning each asset, we can actually perform those swaps. Those things are terribly hard to do in the um, – real world of just getting everybody involved, but it, when it's a, when it's a, a blockchain uh, and where you have tokenized assets and um, people can just send a transaction that gets them into the swap, uh, you know, everything is taken care of. There's a, again, there's a word for that that I'm looking for, but, but really the, the financial use cases are the ones that are winning out right now. And we're still figuring out how uh, the real world um, fits into that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What's yeah. that's blockchain at large, or maybe even Ethereum at large? What about Truffle at large, specifically, like DApps, Web three, this kind of thing? So Truffle, you know, um, I hate to use this example because it's it's kind of it's kind of negative. But if you have a gold rush, um, you know, somebody's got to build the shovels, and uh, and I feel like that's that's where we're at with Truffle. We need to build the tools that people need in order to you know unlock these new 
use cases of the blockchain and, or the next generation uh, of blockchain applications. And that's where we see ourselves uh, as Truffle is um, we know that that there's huge opportunity here, but this opportunity is, isn't going to be uh, taken advantage of uh, if if the tools don't exist. So uh, we're working to build the tools. Uh, we have a heck of a good time uh, building tools that, that people find are, are useful for them and we get great feedback. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we can build the platform and uh, that people use in order to, to build that next generation application or that, that you know, that, uh, what did you call it? The you know, the app that's going to win, whatever it is. There's a word for that. <laughs> killer app. The killer. killer app. Thank you. The killer app. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting, though, with what you said using the shovel analogy, you know, to think of the the way that, Jared, you were just saying earlier, you know, how you love how the internet makes it available to you that you can mm -hmm. define who you are. And in the same way, you know, our ancestors, you know, maybe even one or two, you know, generations up, parents up, You've got people who literally made physical shovels and, mm -hmm. you know, now we're making digital shovels, so to speak. And I think it's just interesting how the world has changed and it is changing and will continue to change to just essentially we're, we're makers. We're just this age's makers. Mm. Very true. Uh, Tim, while you were, where you were talking there, I did find just probably to trigger your brain on a few of the companies <laughs> and projects that are using Truffle in production. You do have some listed um, to give you some more. You mentioned the stable coins. So there's one called Stable, Shapeshift, which is like a currency exchange, Colony right. and Aragon, which I believe these are like a decentralized democratic organization type of uh, operations. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's definitely... Uh, interesting and new things being built with the with the uh, the digital shovels y'all are building. So um, it'll be interesting. Yeah, another one on that list uh, who has been an active Truffle user for a long time and have been using Truffle uh, uh, perfectly um, is Digits Global, and they manage tracking gold, tracking and selling. Uh, we'll just actually say we'll just say tokenizing actual gold so you can sell it and make that uh those markets more fluid mm. that's interesting you remind me of the actually when i when i asked the question about how can you track a diamond they actually have a tiny tiny late well i guess i don't know how big the laser is but the laser is probably just as big as it needs to be but the <laughs> the thing it, it lasers onto the diamond is a sequential number and so that right. number could be you know a you know a token so to speak for the blockchain they it in yeah so right. there you go, Adam. Right. I can try and answer your own question in your own podcast. There you go. Why why do we even have guests, Adam? You can know, just man. answer all your Jeez. own questions. That's interesting. I love that. Perfectly sized lasers. <laughs> this is as big as it needs to be, you know? I don't know. It's not as big as it needs to be. Like, boss, how big is that laser you ordered? He's like, the exact size it needs to be. Okay. Good. Excellent. Well, Tim, uh, anything else before we let you go? Do you have a, a call to action, a way that people can get involved, help out Truffle, uh, help the community effort around this framework and people building on the Ethereum uh, network? Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned previously that Truffle is six people. Uh, I, I haven't looked in the last couple of days, but uh, since Truffle's inception, we've had something over 300,000 downloads of, of Truffle itself, not to mention downloads of Ganache, our blockchain tool. Uh, and so we are, we are six people working as hard as we can uh, to, build, to build these tools for you. Um, what we need and what helps us the most is, is your feedback. So whether or not you're building your own application uh, for a company, or excuse me, whether or not you're building an application for a company or building something for yourself, um, we, we need to hear what problems you're having, uh, what you're getting stopped up on so we can make our tool better, make our, our documentation better, um, and make the whole developer experience better for you. Um, the best way to do that is to uh, hit us up on our Gitter channel, which is uh, gitter.im slash consensus uh, with a Y slash truffle. Or you can send me an email at tim at uh, trufflesuite.com. So... Um, please, please reach out. Oh, and I didn't mention that uh, we uh, are heavily tracking our issues list on GitHub for Truffle and Ganache and Drizzle. Uh, please feel free to write an issue there if you're having one. 
I guess since you mentioned your stats too, we should also mention that awesome dashboard, which is, <laughs> which which does share a lot of the information you just shared there. So you got, you know, it's actually three thousand or three hundred thousand twenty, three hundred twenty seven thousand, uh, seven hundred four downloads lifetime, which is up forty two percent from the past month. And there's a, a quite of an uptick there too, uh, from like September November time frame to now of of downloads. So that's you can see that real time. Yeah, uh, this is open data, so it's it's pulled straight from the services that that provide you those stats. So, for instance, the downloads is pulled directly from npm. GitHub Stars is pulled directly from GitHub. Your browser is actually doing the pulling of that data, so you can keep checking back there. I I check I roughly check that every day or every other day. Um, the this huge growth, this huge uptick, uh, has actually been really surprising to me, and just. Um, it reflects the the growth in the uh, Ethereum community in general because uh, many of the other upticks, if you're looking at our download graph, are related to us putting out a new major version. Where in this case, uh, that uptick just happened. Yeah, to put into perspective too for the listeners, we're looking at uh, I think twenty nine thousand nine hundred twenty five downloads, and this is total downloads in a month. So that number's for that month. So roughly thirty thousand downloads in November. And then come January, they're they're pushing forty seven, almost forty eight thousand downloads into the, in the month of January. So it's a significant difference, right? I wonder how well this chart correlates on top of the price of ETH, mm. as it has also risen to, quite substantially. We need a second plot there, because <laughs> you know there's a reason why the uh, people who are selling shovels were selling them to you know people who are going after gold, because there's there's a lot of money to be. To be made yes. and lost in this in this ecosystem for sure. That's that's true. Absolutely. Uh, if it if it means anything, we're not actually selling any shovel yet. However, um, we are thinking about uh, getting into the support and consulting world. So if you're a uh, well, we'll say new user to Truffle that needs your team on board or onboarded, or um, you you know need some custom work done for you. Uh, please reach out. Very cool. Well, Tim, thanks so much for schooling us on all things uh, shovel making. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. All right, that's it for this episode of The Change Log. Thank you for tuning in. And, you know, if you enjoyed this show, do us a favor, do your friends a favor, share it with them. Read us on Apple Podcasts, go on Twitter and tweet about the show, post it to Hacker News, Reddit, wherever. Share the show. Thank you to our sponsors, Rollbar, Linode, and Gliffy. And of course, Bandwidth for Change Log is provided by Fastly. So go to Fastly.com to learn more. Air monitoring is by Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we host everything we do on Linode cloud servers. Head to Linode.com slash Change Log. Check them out. Support this show. This show is hosted by myself, Adam Stachowiak, and Jared Santo. Editing is by Jonathan Youngblood. Our beats are by Break Master Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at changelaw.com or wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Thanks for tuning in.